To Carol's lawyers, this testimony and the testimony of other women, it speaks to the idea that Trump's alleged sexual predation fit a pattern of behavior. And that pattern is precisely what lawyer George Conway had in mind when he bumped into E. Jean Carroll at a party in New York in 2019. He says Carol mentioned she was thinking of suing Trump, to which Conway replied almost instantly, quote, you have a case. Joining us now is that lawyer and columnist, George Conway. George, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. You were there when this idea sort of crystallized in E. Jean Carroll's head that she could go to court with this. Can you talk a little bit about why the pattern was so key in terms of building a case against Trump? Well, it's interesting because my thinking about it had evolved. I hadn't really thought much about all of the sexual assaults and allegations until um, that summer. And some I saw a thread online where uh, a woman in Massachusetts had put together on Twitter all of the different allegations with all of the different women, like dozens of them. And I thought, that's just, that's incredible because the, the, the similarities yeah. were immense. And it was right around the time, maybe even right after, Jean came out with her book and with the New York Magazine article. And it got me thinking, I, you know, this is, this is a pretty strong case. And I wrote an article. I, rest, I originally wanted to make it a Twitter thread, but then somebody said, oh, I'm making an article. I wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post saying, look, if Republicans believe Juanita Broderick, the woman who made a rape accusation against Bill Clinton, then they better damn well believe uh, e. Jean Carroll, because her her allegations are supported not only by contemporaneous witnesses yes. who heard her tell the story within days, if not minutes, five to seven minutes in, in the case of, of, of Lisa Bernbach. And then you've got all the other cases, just the, the enormous number of cases. And one thing we learned, I mean, I've learned from reading all of the Me Too journalism uh, by uh, Ronan Farrow at The New Yorker and Jody Cantor and her colleague at The New York Times, it's like the things that the thing that, you know, it, it, it's the sexual assault is very, very difficult when it's just two people in a room mm -hmm. and there's nobody else. But the corroboration that you can get from the contemporaneous um, or statements where the, the woman shocked goes to a friend and says, I can't believe what just happened to me. And then the, the men are always the, the men who do these things do them more than once, yeah. dozens of times, yes. and as is the case with Donald John Trump. With, with impunity. With uh, impunity, uh, because they think that, they, that they, because it's their sense of entitlement. They think they can, they, that, that they're a star and they can do it. Yeah, uh, and, use, and so which was articulated by the, right. you know, soon to be president in the Access Hollywood Absolutely. take, right? right. Like the, 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 he lays out the playbook right. and apparently, allegedly, was executing on it for decades. Right. It, was one, it was the one moment where Donald Trump told the truth. What, if you were, I mean, <laughs> I, well, I, I won't get into, I mean, the, the the <laughs> the defense that his team is mounting, which is this kind of relentless barrage of yeah. questions meant to get at the fine details of the story in an effort to undermine its veracity in the case of E. Jean Carroll, or say it was politically motivated on the part of Lisa Bernbach. I mean, what do you make of that, given what it sounds like the strength of the argument from the prosecution? Well, I, it, there is a legitimate way in a very delicate way that lawyers can cross-examine victims or alleged victims of sexual assault. And, and, you, and they have an obligation to do it as a matter of, of, of their professional responsibility. But you have to do it very carefully and keep to the facts. I remember watching once, Court TV used to do instructional videos, Roy um, Black, the famous Miami criminal defense lawyer, did this really astonishingly good cross-examination of the complainant in the William Kennedy Smith case. Mm. And he showed how you do it. You do it respectfully, you do it kindly, and you just go through, okay, this happened, and this happened, and you stack the things that sort of weigh against the, the, the complainant's story. And Takapina did some of that, from what I can tell from reading the live tweeting and, and some of the transcript. Um, but he did it in a much 
kind of a ham-fisted way. Yeah. And I mean, and stuff like to the to the to the consternation uh, uh, of the judge. Yeah. You, I mean, you, you, it's it's okay to ask. Okay, you didn't call such and so. You didn't call your mother. You didn't call the police. You didn't do it. Just very respectfully to go through that. You went back to board drugs. That's all. Le- those are all legitimate questions that should be and that and, and it's appropriate to present that to the jury. But stuff like. Go, you know, being if you're if you're, the, I don't know what the tone was because I wasn't there uh, the way Lisa was. But uh, if if you're asking questions like, oh, you didn't cry on TV, but you cried here, yeah, that well, that, badgering, that's just, relentless, that's just outrageous. disrespectful I mean, it's, questions. It's absurd, and I just think it would backfire in front of a jury. It was 2007, and TV and film writers across the country had just gone on strike. It was a huge strike, and it created a dilemma for all the other creative people who work with writers, people like actors and directors and late-night hosts who had to get on the air that night in front of a live audience without any writers, which is how we got this incredible moment with Conan O'Brien filling airtime on live TV by spinning his wedding ring. Here we go. Uh, Susie, are you ready to time this? We're going for 41 seconds. If we do it, this will be television history. Here we go, and... That's a good spin, that's a good spin. Oh, yeah! Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Susie Santamora, what was the time on that spin? That looked like a good spin to me. 36 seconds. <laughs> Ultimate indignity. Yes. <clears throat> Trust me, there's time to do it again. <laughs> let's not, let's not be in a rush to do it right away. That is the stuff of TV legends. The 2007 writer strike lasted 100 days, during which time Conan O'Brien personally paid the salaries of 75 writers on his show to help, make, help them make ends meet. Now today, for the first time in 15 years, the union representing over 11,000 scripted TV and film writers across the country has once again gone on strike. And just like last time, there is a lot of support for this union. Today, late-night legend Jay Leno went to the picket line to show his support and hand out donuts to striking writers. This was Stephen Colbert last night announcing that his show would go dark during the strike. Everybody, including myself, hopes both sides reach a deal. But I also think that the writers' demands are not unreasonable. I'm a member of the Guild. I support collective bargaining. This nation owes so much to unions. They're the reason. (laughs) Unions. This is true. Unions are the reason we have weekends. And by extension, why we have TGI Fridays. So the next time you enjoy a whiskey glazed blaze burger, you thank a union. Now, you heard Stephen Colbert say there that he hopes both sides reach a deal. On one side of this fight is the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. It represents most of the major TV and film studios. And I should mention here that Comcast, the corporation that owns MSNBC, is one of the companies represented by that group. On the other side is the Writers Guild of America. It represents all of the TV and film writers in their negotiations with those studios. The Writers Guild negotiates one big contract with all the studios, and that contract sets basic pay and work standards for writers across the country. I should also mention that the Writers Guild of America represents workers right here at MSNBC including most of the staff on this show. But MSNBC workers are not covered by the same contract as scripted film and TV workers, which is why my producers are not on strike right right now, and which is why I'm not sitting here spinning any of my various jewelry. Okay, now that we've gotten all of that out of the way, this is why the writers are on strike. In the last 15 years since the writer's strike in 2007, the TV and film industry has changed dramatically. 
which you probably know. The rise of streamers like Netflix and Apple TV and Disney Plus has disrupted the industry bigly. And that has changed the way writers get compensated also bigly. Production companies are relying on smaller teams of writers to pump out more content. The Writers Guild claims that film and TV writers are now making 23% less than what they were a decade ago, thanks in large part to streaming. So now the writers are demanding pay and working conditions that correspond to this new digital age. This is what the Writers Guild said in a statement today. The company's behavior has created a gig economy inside a union workforce, and their immovable stance in this negotiation has betrayed a commitment to further devaluing the profession of writing. The studios released their own statement, saying they remain united in their desire to reach a deal that is mutually beneficial to writers and the health and longevity of the industry. So, yes, this is a story about movies and TV shows and whether or not your favorite programs will be back this fall. But it is also a story about the ways that major technological shifts in society have changed the way arts and culture and even journalism get made and not always for the better. In July of 2019, President Trump convened about 200 conservative social media stars for a summit at the White House. Charlie Kirk was there, and so was James O'Keefe and Diamond and Silk. They weren't White House reporters, but these people were Trump's press corps. You communicate directly with our citizens without having to go through the fake news filter. It's very simple. Together, you reach more people than any television broadcast network by far, not even close. White House estimated that those social media stars had an estimated reach of 100 million people. That is nearly a third of the American population, a strong 30 percent of the population that to this day remains loyal to Trump and probably consumes mostly right wing media. But back in the day, back just a decade earlier, it wasn't really like this. As Ben Smith describes in his new book, big media sites like Gawker and the Huffington Post and BuzzFeed, they use their platforms to generate clicks and traffic. They weren't necessarily in the pursuit of advancing one candidate or ideology. They were there to monetize the attention of an audience. As editor-in-chief of BuzzFeed News from 2011 to 2020, Smith helped establish the site's bona fide news department. But even from that perch... He admits he didn't see how right-wing figures would later co-opt the blogging and social media structures that some had once believed would further progressive causes. Smith writes, I certainly hadn't realized the extent to which the right-wing populism always seemed to be sitting just down the white IKEA table from this progressive Internet scene, looking over its shoulder, learning its lessons. Gasoline can create useful energy, but it can also simply burn. And by 2023, it seemed clear that the power of this new social energy had been to destroy any institution from the media to the political establishment that it touched. Those of us who work in media, politics and technology are largely concerned now with figuring out how to hold these failing institutions together or to build new ones that are resistant to the forces we helped unleash. Joining us now is the man, the author himself, Ben Smith, co-founder and editor-in-chief of Semaphore and author of this new book, Traffic, Genius, Rivalry and Delusion in the Billion Dollar Race to Go Viral, which is out today. Ben, congratulations on this book. I don't know when you had time to write it, um, but you're prolific in many senses of the word. I guess I was very much struck by, I'm not going to call it a mea culpa, but this idea that, you know, in this period of great innovation and, you know, building new sites and things that had never existed before and the optimism inherent in that, something dark was afoot, which is the, the sort of keys, giving, giving another set of people the keys, um, the Rosetta Stone, if you will, to building sites and learning about audiences, which would later um, be bastardized for totally partisan ideological purposes. Yeah. And th thanks for having me on and for the kind words. And I mean, I do think, you know, I started writing the book because it felt like this moment in some sense was coming to an end. I want to mm -hmm. kind of go back and just like figure it out what was this yeah. thing we all, we all lived through. And I think the thing that surprised me most was going back and seeing that there was this, you know, this early Internet scene where um, it, to some degree the explicit goal was to elect Barack Obama for the Huffington Post. That was part of the point, you know, and, and it felt and everyone just took for granted in that world that these were young. These were college kids, young people, newly on the Internet. They were Democrats. Right. Barack Obama visited Facebook. It was sort of went without saying that Facebook was like a Democratic institution. Um, and but when you look and back, then. you know, and, and I think everybody thought, well, the, the, the high point of this 
whole world, this whole new digital world, is the election of Barack Obama. And, you know, in fact, look back, and the high point, the crowning achievement of this sort of new social media world is the election of Donald, Donald Trump. Trump. Absolutely. You know, and it's if you look at the figures who were present at the early in, in these sites like Gavin McInnes, who, of course, late, goes on to found the Proud Boys. He's one of the, co the co-founders of Vice, which is anything but a sort yeah, of just, ev radical right wing publication. Right, right? Everywhere you look. And, and this was sort of this was, kind of came to me as a surprise as I was just reporting out all the characters of this early yeah. scene that, you know, at BuzzFeed, where I where I later worked, um, the guy who founded 4chan was working out of that office. The um, Andrew Breitbart, was a, who was later the sort of key sort of in, part of inventor of these new culture wars, was a co-founder of Huffington Post as well. Um, Gavin McInnes, as you say, a pr the leading Proud Boy, was at Vice. Um, Steve Bannon kind of came out, to, came in to check out Huffington Post and, and learn from it. And, you know, and then I, and, and, and in some ways, I think they were, they adopted the lessons more fully mm -hmm. than, than anybody on, than most people on the left. They were mo most interested in just tearing down these institutions and yeah. actually, at some point, at one point, I went to see Bannon in 2016 in Trump Tower, and I was then the editor of BuzzFeed, and he was just totally puzzled at, at why hadn't BuzzFeed gone all in for Bernie Sanders the way he had for Trump. You know, not because he loved Bernie Sanders per se, but just because that's where the traffic was. Why not just follow the heat wherever it leads? Do you? I mean, and certainly Bannon has built a, a stunning amount of grift on the back of like his, his uh, intellectual properties, if you will. But has it? What, your sense is that it was always for the traffic. It was always for the money. It was sort of an un, uh, a part of the market that did not have an adequate response, and so they filled that gap. It wasn't necessarily an ideological drive that led these folks to ultimately found the institutions that they'd created. You know, I think these things are all tied up together. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think it's quite that simple, but I do think that there were these new tools that turned out to be just perfect for serving this very angry moment I mean, Facebook in particular, you know, it was, it was this great tool, you know, for, for spreading these, you know, these, this new real angry energy. And yeah. then as Facebook, I think, started to get freaked out by it and adjusted to it and started tweaking its dials to say, wait, wait, we don't want people sharing fake stories about Hillary Clinton body doubles. We want it to be, we want like more meaningful stories that people engage with. And then what that would be was like a Donald Trump meme and you replying, kill yourself in the comments. And then that being shared to everybody because the algorithm has decided that you are deeply engaged. And, <laughs> you know, it was sort of a combination of, like, I think the real politics of how people felt and a system that was sort of designed to amplify what's probably kind of worst in us. Why do you think that the people who own these sites, whether it's Mark Zuckerberg or to some degree Elon Musk, uh, even Jonah Peretti, are so reluctant to adopt the, an the mantle of publishers because they have become the purveyors of information and there's just this deep, like, abiding resistance to really embracing that. I, it's a headache for sure, but the reality is, you know, Facebook is a, it's an information, it's not a, it's not just a website, it's not just to connect people. It's where people get their information. The same is true for Twitter. The, the, the efforts to kind of figure out how to make Twitter responsible have been so fraught, so ham-handed. I won't even comment about what Musk is doing, but there seems to be a deep-seated cultural, like, it's yeah. antithetical to who these guys are. Yeah, I think you're right. I don't th I mean, I think that to some degree, you know, it's nice to have free content rather than content you pay for. If you're a business, yeah. you get to keep all the money. So some of it is commercial, but some of it, as you say, like is ideological. And not, I don't mean left-right ideological. I mean this sense that w that the we want we should we can do away with all the old institutions, the old East Coast media. And if we just sort of throw it open to the crowd, they'll replace it with something better. It's actually kind of utopian, I think. And if you and if you go back and read things from the early 2000s, which I'm sure we were probably both writing yeah. as well, you know, there was a sense of like, wow, this is going to be this wide open world. It's going to overthrow like a corrupt establishment media that had gotten the Iraq war so wrong. There's yep. a lot of like real optimism, I think for good reason. But, you know, at some point, they, I think they were really unable to let go of that fantasy. And I think when you look at the trajectory of those businesses now, of those sites now, like, I don't think it was a good business decision, among other things. Yeah. And now we have, you know, BuzzFeed is shuttering. BuzzFeed News is shuttering. Vice mm -hmm. is maybe filing for bankruptcy. It's a very important time to be writing something like this. It's also, I don't know, it's kind of a depressing moment to kind of take stock of what just happened to the country and what happened to the Internet in the last 20, well, 15 years. Yeah, it's a, it's a very strange moment. It's, it was just really a, 
a trip to go back and see how we all thought about it yes. then and, and how it turned out and I think how people could have made different decisions along the way. And we have known each other for quite some of that the, time, the, the my whole friend. Time, yeah. Congratulations on the book, Ben Smith. The book is Traffic. Thank you for your time, buddy. Thanks so much for having me, Alex.